We take a journey to New York, the city of skyscrapers. And this time we arrive at a structure that dates back to the time of New York streets with flashy street lamps and horse-drawn carriages roaming the cobblestone streets. It is one of the city's oldest surviving skyscrapers. It is noteworthy for its distinctive appearance and the fact that it is one of the main structures of the Beaux-Arts classicist trend. This is Iconic Builds, and in this episode, we'll take a closer look at the Flatiron Building, which was auctioned a few days ago. This steel-framed 22-story structure has a height of 285 feet, or 86.9 meters, and is situated at 175 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, New York City. The triangular shape of this object, which is reminiscent of a cast iron clothes iron, gave it the moniker Flatiron. But in some sources, it is said that the source of the name of the building is derived from the area where it is located, in the Flatiron District, has nothing to do with its metal construction. Daniel H. Burnham, a pioneer in the design and construction of skyscrapers, created the structure. Many people believe Burnham to be the father of the skyscraper. Beginning in March 1901, media stated that the Newhouse family intended to sell Eno's Flatiron to Harry S. Black, CEO of the Fuller Company, for around $2 million. Black founded Cumberland Realty Company, an investment company. The Fuller Corporation, which specialized in building skyscrapers, was the first real general contractor, handling all stages of building construction. In February 1901, Black commissioned Daniel Burnham's team to create a 21-story structure for the location. The building would be the first skyscraper north of Union Square, the highest structure in Manhattan north of the Financial District, and Burnham's first in New York City. On June 2, 1901, the New York Herald published a picture of the location with the title Flatiron Building. Plans for a 20-story skyscraper on the property were submitted in August of that year by Corydon Purdy, the project's structural engineer. The building was depicted in a graphic that appeared in the Real Estate Record and Guide in October 1901. Although it was titled The Cumberland, it was extremely close to the Flatiron Building's final form. Pennsylvania's American Bridge Company produced the steel skeleton of the structure. Since air-powered tools were better than steam-powered ones at transmitting power over great distances, workers used them to rivet the steel beams together. By February of 1902, the framework of the top stories had been built, and the work started on placing the terracotta tiles. The building's terracotta tile was partially installed by mid-May 1902, after the building's frame was finished in February 1902. The neighborhood of Manhattan marveled as this enormous Meccano was assembled and finished in just one year. By June 1902, the steel-framed 20-story skyscraper was one of New York City's highest tower blocks at the time. The Flatiron Building was designed as a vertical Renaissance palazzo with beaux art styling. It is a prime example of the Chicago School's vision of skyscrapers. In contrast to the early buildings in New York, that had the shape of towers rising from a lower, blockier bulk, like the present-day Singer Building. The Flatiron Building's front is separated into a base, shaft, and capital, much like the components of a classical Greek column. With one circular window on each floor above the base, the southwest and southeast corners are curved. Limestone makes up the three-story base's front. The base's apertures are each two bays wide, in addition to the centers of the Fifth Avenue and Broadway elevations, there are entrances on either end of the 22nd Street elevation. Four storefront windows surround each entry on Fifth Avenue and Broadway to the north and south at ground level. As is so often with iconic structures, the building's design did not sit well with critics, and the New York Tribune famously called it a stingy piece of pie. It was called a monster by the New York Times. The building's triangle shape made the offices incredibly small and difficult to decorate. It was referred to by the tenants as a rabbit warren of strangely shaped rooms. In general, the structure was seen as quirky, with drafty wood-framed and copper-clad windows, no central air conditioning, a heating system that used cast-iron radiators, 
an outdated sprinkler system, and only one stairway in case an evacuation was required. Despite all these negative comments, we can say that the building is still interesting because recently this large building was auctioned. After the owners were unable to come to an agreement over the renovation of the building, the sale was made public. It was slated to take place on March 22, 2023. According to a report, the building's principal owners, GFB Real Estate Newmark and ABS Real Estate, who together own 75% of the structure, wanted to keep possession of it. Jacob Garlick eventually won the sale of the skyscraper for $190 million, outbidding the previous owners. On the steps of the Manhattan County Courthouse on Wednesday afternoon, outsider Jacob Garlick's Abraham Trust outbid one of the building's former owners, Jeffrey Gural. According to insiders at the process, Garlick submitted a winning bid of $190 million for the landmarked triangular building. We will see together what kind of transformation the building will experience with its new owners. It seems that the story of this iconic building is still not finished. It continues to be written.